Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now in this episode of Story of an Icon, I'd like to speak about a watch which I haven't spoken about very much on the channel before, but is a fascinating piece of history, and also draws a great deal on British military history, whether it's in the, uh, the land, uh, land army, or indeed in the air with the RAF. And this is the IWC Mark series pilot's watch, which evolved from a very different history to a great deal of other pilot's watches with a simple three-hand arrangement, and which today takes on a very different form to its original form in the late 1940s. However, in truth, its history runs back to the mid-1930s, when IWC started its first uh, attempts at producing pilot's watches, though there were initially two very different styles of IWC pilot's watches, which created the backbone for this timepiece. Now, the first of the two pilot's watch styles which IWC produced were the very large b watches produced for the German government. Now, in 1935, when Hitler and the Nazi Party were developing their ambitions of having an air force, um, indeed under the direction of, of Goering, they, uh, they commissioned the creation of these very large 55mm pilot's watches for their military pilots to wear. And these followed a very, very uh, typical design, which, uh, which has become really a benchmark for a great deal of pilot's watches with those large styles of luminescent sword hands and those highly legible no-date dials. And in, in the time, five brands produced them, four of which were German, uh, the German ones being Larco, uh, Stover, Elangenzona, and Wemper. However, in much smaller numbers, IWC produced some as well for this, uh, this commission following 1935. And it should be noted that uh, today a number of brands still produce this style of pilot swatch because it's become just such an iconic form and has inspired pilot swatches for decades afterwards. And so the one in the picture is uh, a rather remarkable remake and an original which I, I took a look at at the Larco stand at Baselworld, which is a brand which I have a great deal of respect for and, uh, and which makes some incredible products. So um, their remake of these watches is probably the most accurate. But nonetheless, IWC still produced one other style, which in many ways lines up with the, the Mark series much more accurately and much more tightly in terms of its history. In 1936, IWC released the, uh, the watch which they would refer to as the Spezial Uhr für Flieger, and I appreciate my pronunciation must be appalling, but in English that translates as a special watch for aviators or pilots. And that really is what this timepiece was, which was a 38mm stainless steel watch with a manually wound calibre 83, which was uh, their own calibre, which was temperature and shock resistant, um, but, uh, but of course, it, as was the era, um, as was the standard for the era rather, it was manually wound. And it featured a dial which was very typical of aviation pocket watches or wrist watches of the period because one sees a black dial and very large, oversized, radium-painted numerals on a black dial, whilst the hands were these cathedral styles of hands with metal rims, and they were filled with, uh, with radium paint in order to make them glow in the dark. One can also notice the fact that around the outside of that acrylic crystal, you can see a knurled sort of bezel, and so this would be easily rotated um, wearing gloves or simply with bare hands, and unlike some watches of the period, such as Hanhart's, for instance, the pip to mark where you were timing from on the bezel wasn't on the outside of the watch, but rather found its place under the crystal in the form of this triangular piece, which rotated above the dial and the hands, and which featured a, a radium-painted coat in order to be able to glow in the dark with the hands, and to be used in conjunction with those in order to time elapsed um, times, or simply to, to set a mark if you were, uh, you were flying a plane and you had to navigate. It should be noted, however, that this watch was available to the general public, unlike some of the other um, commissioned watches produced in the later Mark series, until really the 90s when it became a, a widely publicly available watch. But this watch did go by one other name, and I think this is more of a retrospective name as a result of what came after it, which is the Mark IX. Because following this came the Mark X, which was a military watch produced for the MOD in Britain as a result of their new needs during the Second World War. The next watch in this line was the very famous IWC Mark X. And the reason why the Mark X was made was because in 1939, after the start of the war, the British Military of Defence required a watch to be issued to their, their soldiers, their troops, that would be resistant to the elements and would fulfil the criteria they, they needed in terms of being something reliable, accurate, and something which would be suitable for soldiers in the field. And in fact, 12 brands produced these, which were Omega, JLC, Saima, Record, Eterna, Lamania, Buren, Timor, Vertex, Longines, Grana, and IWC. And of all of these, uh, IWC produced about 6,000 of these watches. Um, whilst there are more rare models, the IWCs do tend to fetch a, a quite significant price if they are sold. But they required a few specifications uh, for these watches to function correctly in the field. So in terms of their movements, they had to have 15 dual movements between 11.75 and 13 lines, that's the, the width of the movement, 
They also needed these watches to be tested for timekeeping, just to be be, be certain that they would be suitable for, um, for, for, for operations where timing was, was of the essence. However, in my eyes, I would view the dial designs put forward for these watches, uh, and which were specified by the MOD, as being the, the most important to the evolution of the Mark series. Because these watches had to have black dials with uh, with white numerals uh, in Arabic numerals running around the edge of the dial, in addition to uh, to luminous markings at each hour, and of course in this period those would have been radium, whilst the hands also had to match those being uh, radium uh, coated in order to glow in the dark. In addition to this, they had to feature a fully connected and complete minute track running around the edge of the dial in this railway style whilst they also had to feature a shatterproof crystal and a certain degree of water resistance with a case which had a stainless steel back, or in the case of certain versions, a full stainless steel case. Interestingly, I would argue that this watch was the most modern looking of all of these Mark 10 models produced by the variety of brands that did partake in their production. And the reason why I say this is because the dial was not cluttered, it was quite loosely structured, very formalised in terms of having those, um, those three pips at 12 o'clock, and the, the larger luminous markers at 9, 3, and 6. Likewise, the hands appear extremely well sculpted and look very uh, very ahead of their time, with a shape which was more uh, more similar to something from the 60s than something from the, the late 30s and the early 40s. And so these make a very interesting base for the legendary Mark 11 to jump off. The first true IWC Mark series pilot's watch, though, would have to be the 1948 Mark 11. And the Mark 11 has become a true icon of the world of pilot's watches, it's one of the most recognisable designs, with its 36mm stainless steel case and that incredible dial. But in terms of its origins, it was created in 1948 to military specification for the RAF, and, uh, and it came into service in 1949 to be used by navigators, um, but later was in fact introduced to pilots as their watch as well. Of course, as with the Mark 10, the Mark 11 was produced directly to RAF and MOD specifications. The watch had a 36mm stainless steel water-resistant case, with a screwed down crystal to prevent its loss under under low pressure if the cabin were to uh, to lose pressure in an aircraft. Likewise it featured a black dial and luminous hands in a similar way and as you can see the uh, the radium was applied to 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock and, and 9 o'clock to provide good legibility at night. Two details which were particularly specified by the MOD were the, the anti-magnetism of the watch and the seconds because these watches featured soft iron cores, so in terms of having a soft iron dial in addition to a shield at the back of the case to protect the watch from magnetic fields which you'd, you'd um, experience inside the, ca the cabin of an aircraft, bearing in mind all of the, the electronics and the machinery working around you, and also just in terms of the geographic changes um, in magnetic fields to avoid any danger to the watch movement and its accuracy. And speaking of accuracy, the seconds also had to be hacking in order for the watch to be able to be synchronised with other watches. And in terms of the dials of these watches, one sees that fantastic black base with this instantly recognisable set of numerals running around the edge of the dial, and of course, as I mentioned, the, um, the luminescent markers at the three quadrants of the dial, whether they're in radium, as some people have said the early models were, or tritium, as the vast majority of these watches tend to be. But certainly with that squared off um, hour hand and the pencil uh, minute hand, one really has an iconic design. But in terms of their, their movement, they had something else which was extremely revered and very, very well recognised. Beating inside this watch was the IWC Calibre 89, which has become recognised as one of the most iconic, but also one of the most functional and accurate movements of the 20th century, where these, um, these military movements were concerned. And so it was a manually wound movement which in many ways was quite simple in terms of its, its requirements because it was required to keep to an accuracy of, of minus four to plus four seconds a day. Likewise, it also had to feature a glycodur balance, a Nivrox hairspring, and also had to feature a second hand in, at the centre of the dial, rather than offset at the six o'clock position, which was a fairly crucial aspect of the movements um, featured uh, before this watch. Now, interestingly, it did run at 18,000 vibrations per hour, which can be viewed as a slower beat rate to what you would expect nowadays, but it was perfectly suitable for the time. And in terms of the, the maintenance and the preparation of these movements, they were all tested for 44 days at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, um, during which time they were tested for accuracy, anti-magnetism, and then the whole case was tested for water resistance. In terms of these watches' use in the field, they were used quite extensively across the Commonwealth countries, but in terms of the, the areas where they were first used, they were first used by the RAF and the Fleet Air Arm, so the, the naval force um, of the air, in 1949, and later on in 1950, um, air forces such as the Australian Air Force received the watches as well. And so one sees this watch uh, really broaden across the, the, the Anglophone world, in terms of being, uh, being a functional pilot's watch for all of their aviation. 
Now, JLC also produced a small run of about 2,000 models, um, but IWC was ultimately chosen to be the, the manufacturer to, uh, to continue producing them, and the, the last order was believed to pass in 1953, though they did continue to be used until 1981. Of course, a number of these watches were sold publicly and worn outside the military, and the estimates for these watches tend to vary, but around the 1,000 mark tends to be the, the number that people tend to refer to. And it should be noted though that these watches were never designed to be luxury timepieces. They were watches designed for a purpose with a very robust build, and simply designed to fulfil their, their, their stated characteristics of accuracy, anti-magnetism and, and resistance to the elements extremely well. It should be noted though there were a few changes with this watch over time. In terms of, for instance, the very early watches um, before uh, the early 1950s, featuring an Arabic numeral at 12 instead of the triangle. And likewise, there was a change in terms of the dials, where they changed from radium to tritium in the early 60s, um, in order to, um, to just uh, move with the times in terms of the, the danger as well, associated with the use of radium on dials of watches, with tritium being a more suitable option. And of course, with this, one sees the, the change to having a, a circled T on the dial as well, stating the fact that the dial was painted with tritium. Rather remarkably, the Mark 11 was only replaced in 1993 by the Mark 12. And the Mark 12 was a very different product, because it remained at 36mm in size, but otherwise was very heavily changed. One sees the surface of the case was very delicately brushed, with, uh, with a far more intricate uh, finishing, as this was designed to be a watch for the masses, as well as for, for pilots. The crown was also more detailed, and the dial was, uh, was thoroughly revised, though kept the same spirit as the original. These watches also started to feature sapphire crystals and spring bars so you could attach more variations of straps. However, the spirit of the watch did remain the same, and one sees this very much in the dial, which remained this black form, albeit more heavily branded with IWC Schaffhausen Mark 12 Automatic. And so the watch did also still feature tritium on the dial, in the same positions as before at 12, 6, 3 and 9. However, there was one change to the dial which was quite profound, which was the addition of a date, and so the date was placed at the, the conventional 3 o'clock position to make the watch a more, a more usable and, and generally more, more user-friendly format. One other detail on the dial was fundamentally new, and that was the addition of automatic, because this was the first automatic um, watch in the Mark line, and it featured a JLC movement, which of course is ironic because Gégé Le Coudre also made a, a, a version of the, the, the Mark 11 in the early 1950s and late 1940s. And of course, JLC has an incredible history of making movements, with, for example, the 920, which, uh, which was a, an incredible movement used in, in all of the, um, the, the Holy Trinity brands, and which remains the, the slimmest uh, full-size rotor automatic movement to this present day. But the movement chosen for this watch was the JLC 884-2, uh, which was a 36 joule 4 hertz movement with a 40-hour power reserve. And effectively, what this allowed the watch to be was far more luxurious than previously seen, because the movement ran to much higher beat rate and so had a much smoother tick to the second hand, whilst it also had far more, um, more, more, more refinement in terms of more joules and slightly longer power reserve in terms, of, uh, in terms of running for longer. And so this was a very refined movement in terms of being a luxury movement fitted to a sports watch in quite an interesting arrangement. And I view this watch as quite an interesting transitional timepiece because it featured a great deal of the specifications of its, its uh, forebear in terms of having the 36mm case, and indeed that, uh, that iconic dial. But it was willing to bring it into the, um, into the 90s with that automatic movement, which was not quite as robust in terms of the, the, sheer, uh, the sheer abuse it could take as its predecessor, was a very refined and extremely interesting movement, which did push this watch forward in terms of being more of a luxury item. And of course the addition of a metal bracelet also made this watch all the more competitive in the new market it faced. And so this watch creates quite an interesting bubble, because its successor in 1999 changed the, the style again with a larger case and a different movement. Released in 1999, the Mark 15 was another interesting model, and its name is certainly a, a rather curious one. And the reason for this jump from, from 12 to 15 was due to superstitions around the world concerning 13 and 14, so they chose to just jump straight to 15 instead, which is understandable. But it's interesting because this watch was a very, uh, a very curious change for the Mark series, because it changed size, movement, but also its design changed quite subtly. Now this was the last, in fact, of the traditional dialed versions of the Mark series, and so does command uh, quite an interesting position in the history of this watch. But starting with the case, the watch grew from 36 to 38 millimeters in um, in favor of a larger case for a more modern era. 
Likewise, it featured a more delicate case, though, in many ways than its predecessors, because in addition to the brushed surfaces, there were polished elements on the bezel, just to, um, to, to, to somewhat to break up that design, and also reduce the, the brutality and the harshness of a satin or a matted brushed finish, albeit um, on all of these watches the, um, the, the brushed elements are extremely finely done and really were moving towards a luxury segment. Where the dial was concerned, one could see a change as well, because whilst the general style of the design was the same, there were some touches that did change. So for instance, the, the date window was more finely cut, and of course in a different position because the movement changed. Likewise, the numerals, um, and indeed um, their, their placement on the dial, changed slightly because they became larger, slightly more bold on the dial, but still retained the delicate touches that were added when the Mark 11 turned to the Mark 12. The hands similarly remained the same, with a pencil minute hand, and that squared off hour hands to create a recognisable design, but in a very modern package. The movement of the watch was also given real modernity, but a modernity that a lot of people rejected in terms of, uh, of their appreciation for the movement choice in this watch. Because instead of going back to JLC, or indeed to their own movements, they looked to ETA, because they produced the calibre 37524 for this watch. And really what that to that was, was a top grade and uh, chronometer spec version of the ETA 2892-A2. And really this was an interesting move, because whilst it wasn't in any way as prestigious a movement, it was certainly just as well prepared. Because the movement in this case was, was of the highest grade when it was first put into the watch, but also it was entirely reworked in-house to create a truly reliable, but also extremely well decorated variant of the movement. IWC also tested these movements extremely rigorously, being tested in five positions and indeed for temperature, which is a, a, a clever touch, I think, because it allowed these movements to not be dismissed for simply being ETAs, but in many ways these were still extremely well prepared movements, and ones which could, could uh, have a balance of something which was designed to be an ultra-slim movement in the 1960s, but which had evolved into something very robust in this watch through IWC's modifications. And so I would view this watch as the last of an era, in terms of being the last of the truly original dialed styles of these IWC Mark series watches. In 2006, IWC launched what was the first of their more modern line of Mark series pilot's watches. And these began with the Mark 16. And the Mark 16 grew to 39mm, um, so now we're 3mm above the original 36, and changed completely in terms of its dial arrangement and in terms of its, its proportions. The case shape remained very similar, and similarly did the crown. However, details began to change around the case. So whilst there remained the polished elements on the case to give a bit of shape and a bit of, uh, a bit of curve to the case, for example along the edge of the lugs, one did see a, a change in terms of their approach to the watch. For instance, gone was the, the, um, the simple, um, simple style of, um, of creased leather strap, and instead now was an alligator strap to, to really make this watch more formal and make it more of a luxury timepiece. Then, of course, details like the crown changed, where they now featured the modern Probus Scafusha style of logo, instead of the original fish seen on these, these crowns, which uh, symbolised the water resistance. The most visually striking change, though, from Mark 15 to Mark 16, comes in the form of the dial. Because until this stage, they'd had a very recognisable arrangement for the dial, which I think worked extremely well for these watches. But with the Mark, fi the Mark 16, rather, one sees this transition back towards what Fliegers tended to look like, in the 30s and 40s, which I spoke about at the start of the video. Instead of the pencil hands, there now were these rather large, and perhaps more legible actually, styles of, uh, of sword hands, which take this, this particular pilot style, and are squared off on their tip. Likewise, the dial itself remained matte black, albeit um, with these watches there were some limited editions in different colours, um, which, uh, which I won't be going into really in this video, just because, uh, um, because really I'm focusing on the core models. But aside from that, one had a matte black dial with these luminous markers around the edge of the dial. And so in addition to this, one had the, um, the 12 o'clock marker as that triangle moved up to the 12 o'clock position with those two dots to match that Flieger style. The movement in this watch also changed in terms of its, uh, its name, but also in terms of a few small details. You may also notice that the date disc has changed colour, so now it's white on black to match the dial, rather than the more bold um, black on white. And the movement now is the calibre 30110 which is another revised IWC modified version of the ETA 2892-A2. And so with this version, the, 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 uh, the power reserve increased to 42 hours, but generally it was a revision of what was already an extremely reliable and very robust movement, which really, I think, complements this watch's per per personality, if you will, 
as a timepiece designed to be a no-nonsense pilot's watch, but still have a certain complexity to it. After six years of production, the Mark 16 was replaced entirely by the Mark 17. And the Mark 17 came out in 2012, and at the time was quite a divisive watch because it introduced several touches to the Mark series which weren't to be expected. These were seen in the addition of colour to the dial, and the continuation of several styles on the dial of the, the Mark 16, except made more bold and far, far more, um, more significant. Now, starting with the size of the case, this is the largest version of the Mark series watch so far, at 41mm in diameter, and still in stainless steel with those beautiful uh, polished bevels down the sides of the case, in addition to polished elements on the bezel, with this, um, the, this general brushing on the rest of the case, to give both a sporty, but also quite luxurious touch to this timepiece. Mechanically, the watch continued to use the same base of the ETA2892 in this watch, and so didn't really advance at all in terms of what it was doing with that, but still, that was a very sturdy base for this watch, and I think that calibre was a good choice in terms of uh, giving longevity, but also reasonable servicing prices. Uh, but in terms of the stylistic changes, this was really where the, che where the, the watch uh, saw its, uh, its evolution. Because through the larger size, it also gained several touches on the dial. Now, gone were the, the numerals at 12, uh, 3, 6, and 9, as was the case on the Mark 16. And these didn't come back on this variant. Likewise, um, one did see a few changes, though, which, uh, which weren't present, though, on the Mark 16. And these were seen in the form of the very large and rather blocky, but quite soft numerals running around the edge of the dial. Now, I personally rather like this aesthetic. I think it gives real charm to the dial and makes it look very different to any other of these Flieger style watches on the market, especially since at 41mm it now is competing with them for its size. Undoubtedly, though, the largest touch to this watch which was changed was the addition of that triple date window. And the way that the triple date window works is that you simply have a larger cutout for the date, with a large red arrow pointing to the correct date being the central one. And this added a sort of a, a certain charm, it looked a bit like a, um, a, an aircraft gauge, which is a nice touch, especially on a watch where the vast majority of them will never see use by, uh, by a pilot, but rather will remain rather casual, but very attractive timepieces with a bit of water resistance at 60 metres, and, uh, and some, um, uh, some resistance to the elements in the form of the, the soft iron core to protect it from magnetism, and of course a crystal which is negative pressure resistant. But overall this was a relatively minor change in terms of the general concept of the watch, but stylistically, nonetheless, uh, really did raise quite a few eyebrows with the larger size and the general redesign of the timepiece as a whole. Released in 2016, we come onto the present model of the Mark series from IWC. And this is the Mark 18. And whilst I tend to be someone who tends to gravitate towards the original designs of things, so whilst I adore the design of the, the Mark, uh, Mark 11, I did have trouble, um, trouble liking the, the models from the early 2000s, I must say, with the Mark 18, I think IWC have really refined the design to a fantastic degree. And whilst it isn't what the original Mark 11 was, and I know a lot of people find that troublesome with these watches, I really think it's still an incredible looking watch, and a piece which understands what it's trying to be very, very well. And with the Mark 18, IWC shrunk the case by 1mm back to 40mm, which is something that's been praised by a great many people, because it makes the watch just that little bit more wearable for a lot of people, and I think also helps with the, the aesthetics of the watch. It is also only 11mm thick, which makes it altogether more wearable as a timepiece um, than something significantly thicker like a 15mm chronograph. And with this watch, the case aesthetic has remained very similar, with that circular brushing, the, the, the slight polished bevels along the edge of the lugs, and the polished elements on the bezel, which is now slightly slimmer. The dial is also a fantastic piece of design, because now it really is symmetrical in terms of its arrangement, with the, the numerals added back to, to uh, 9 and 6, which I think was a very, very good idea, and helps to make the dial appear all the more aesthetically pleasing. Likewise, the, um, the placement of the, the triangle at 12 o'clock has been taken off the second track, which again is a nice touch, and helps to, to create clear grading between the different sections of the dial. Then one has a very nicely boxed and, and stepped um, date window, which appears slightly slimmer and, and smaller on this watch than before due to the, the arrangement of the dial, but nonetheless is still that white on black arrangement and is very elegant. And of course the hands remain unchanged in their style. But really the, um, the, the way they've, they've designed this watch um, is really based upon the same movement, because they've renamed the movement the, the Calibre um, uh, 30111, which is the ETA version, and then if you go for, for a version with the Salita movement, um, which are both interchangeable by the way, the Salita is the SW300-1, which is tested and regulated to the same standard as the ETA, 
is the 35111. And IWC has released quite a few different variants of these watches, but I'd like to focus on three of those, because I think three of them um, provide three different variants and interpretations of this timepiece, which I think are, are, um, are relevant to this video, in terms of speaking of the history. And the first is the Top Gun Miramar version, which, uh, which is a version which came out at the same time as the, um, as the Mark 18. And really what this is, is a ceramic cased version. So the case is all in black, um, black polished ceramic, which is an interesting concept because it, it, it really does turn the concept of a stainless steel pilot's watch on its head. Whilst the dial also changes colour to a sort of an anthracite with aged luminova and 24 hour graduations which run around the inside of the dial. And so this creates, in many ways, a much more technical style of um, of pilot's watch, which is perhaps more in more in keeping with uh, with the modern world in terms of being something more technical and less classical. Of course, whilst much more brittle than steel, I can understand the benefits of having a ceramic option for the case because it is just so enormously scratch resistant that uh, that you really are able to wear a watch in a very different way especially if you're not banging the watch around on things, then it's able to survive much, much better with the, the small scratches and scuffs that normally a watch would accumulate. And since then, they've produced a variety of, um, of, of different variants with different colours of dial, um, and the, the most recent version with a ceramic case is the Laureus uh, Sport for Good Foundation version with a blue dial. However, there is also the 2017 Titanium version, because they released the Mark 18 Heritage as a titanium version of the watch, which is, uh, is fully matted in, in terms of its, uh, its case design, but features an aged and faded style of dial with, uh, with aged luminova and these beautiful blued hands. And so here one does see IWC experimenting with new options for the future of the Mark series, with titanium being quite an interesting option. And of course, this is a heritage inspired model, so it's able to give that, that slightly darker tone to the metal, which looks like aged steel in some ways which of course complements the, the connected second track around the edge of the dial, for instance. But this does offer a lighter watch, and, and indeed a watch which offers um, quite interesting properties as opposed to steel. The piece which I'd like to end with, though, in terms of speaking about, is a limited edition from 2017, which I spoke about when it, when it was released. Because this is the IWC Mark 18 tribute to Mark 11. And what this effectively was, was a limited edition of uh, 1948 pieces where they'd taken the same case as the stainless steel version of the Mark 18, except now it was fitted with the, the older style of hands and dial of the original uh, Mark 11 style of watch. And whilst I would argue this dial is perhaps a bit more similar to the dial used um, on, for example, the Mark uh, 12 as a result of the date and as a result of the automatic text, it's a very, very interesting and, and rather playful reinterpretation of the Mark 11 pilot's watch, and was something I rather liked then and I think still looks fantastic in terms of something of a, a reimagination. It really would be fantastic to see one of these watches appear in the standard line alongside the modern style to really complement it in the collection. And so that concludes my history of these rather fascinating IWC pilot's watches, which of course originated with military specifications in the 1930s and 40s, and continued on to the present day as something far, far more, and somewhere between a sports watch, a, a tool watch, and a luxury item. And so do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of the video, and whether there are any particular variants of the Mark series that you particularly like. And if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to see more videos and content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armin the Watch Guy, out.